What are the biggest themes in the class? We'll start with the one that is most close to computing models, which I'll call universality. The main thing that we looked at computing models for, there are lots of different reasons we define computing models. The biggest one was the fact that all these properties about computation seem to be universal. So what are examples of places where we saw universality? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so we saw just a NAND gate is enough to compute every Boolean function. We can compose them in a circuit. We can compute every Boolean function with enough NAND gates. And we saw other sets of gates that are also universal. So this is a very powerful notion that there aren't all these ad hoc different notions of computing. Once you have this notion of Boolean functions and circuits, there are lots of different things that end up computing this universal set of all the things you can compute with a function. Of course, you're defining that set in terms of your computing model, but the fact that it's so robust and that you need a very small amount to define that set is very powerful. Right? And we've saw other examples with Turing machines. We've seen that a very simple model of computing, and we've seen a few variations on Turing machines, they can compute every computable function. Of course, what's a computable function? A function that can be computed with our model of computing. So that's a very circular notion, but the Church-Turing thesis is sort of saying that it's kind of a circular notion, but it corresponds to our notion of what any machine that we can build in this universe or any universe we can imagine can compute. And we also saw even the costs, this is where we ended up with this class of polynomial time, the cost can be defined very robustly, even if we vary properties about the machine, like whether it's a RAM machine or a tape machine, the costs change, but within this large computing cost class, are the same. So I group all those as being related to universality. Another theme that we've seen in lots of different ways across this, and it is, is related, at least how we showed universality in a lot of those cases was simulation. And I'm going to call out simulation as what we're doing in simulation is using one thing to do another. We're able to simulate one kind of machine with another machine. We're able to solve one problem with another problem. All of these are kind of variations on the same idea of simulation as a way of showing equivalence or showing that one thing is more powerful than another. So we saw a simulation that we can simulate a Boolean circuit with a NAND circ straight line program and vice versa. That means they're equivalent if one can simulate the other and the other can simulate one in both directions. And we saw the same thing with gate sets for Boolean circuits. And we saw in cases where maybe one direction is really obvious, we saw that we could simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine with a Turing machine. That one is no more powerful, and then the other direction, the equivalence is there as well. So that could have been in the other category. And our uncomputability and hardness proofs are kind of like this as well. They're maybe not the same as simulating one machine with another, but we're saying if we had a machine that could do X, we could use it to do Y. Right? We could build something using that machine to do something else. So I think these are all at some level connected to the idea of using simulation to show equivalence. OK. Counting. We've used counting a lot. I think you probably thought you knew how to count before this class. Hopefully, you still know how to count, although it's more complicated than you thought, maybe. Wherever we use counting, why is counting such a powerful idea? Yeah. Good, yeah. So we've used counting to show things don't exist, to show there are functions that we can't compute. Right? That our way of measuring cost is counting. If we're trying to understand in a formal way the cost of doing something, that's almost always a counting problem. So we've seen counting lots of places. I think that real powerful ones are these proofs that we've done. And we've seen two examples, ones that I think are most important. We showed that the number of Boolean functions of size input n is greater than the number of circuits that are small, where we had a more precise than small in quotes definition of what it meant to be small. By just counting and comparing the number of functions to the number of circuits, that said there must be some functions that are hard to compute, that we need a large circuit to do. And then when we extended that to uniform computation, we said, well, now we needed Cantor's result. Now we're dealing with infinities, but that there are different kinds of infinities, that they're uncountable versus countable sets. And the number of functions is uncountable. And the number of Turing machines is countable. 
Turing machines is just the way we chose to represent computation formally. But anything where we can write down programs in a finite length string is going to be countable. We're not going to be able to have a program that corresponds to every function because the number of functions is uncountable. But this is a, a very strong and robust result. OK. This is a theory class. Most of what we've done in this class has been about we have some mathematical model. And based on that mathematical model, we can prove things. We can reason about some things are possible, some things are not, some things are equivalent, some things are not. Some things have this cost, some things have that cost. All of this is in this mathematical abstract domain. Mathematical models are really powerful. They allow us to make things precise. They allow us to use all the tools of logic. Use all the tools of logic and, and formal reasoning to get really precise, strong, robust answers. Right? This is the kind of thing that we can do. And why we end up with these definitions of complexity classes like NP-complete, where we can answer very precisely for any problem whether or not it's in the class. And once it's in the class, we know all sorts of things about it. We know that unless p equals np, there's no efficient solution to it. All of these things that we have from these abstract mathematical objects that we've defined and reasoned about give us ability to have, have really robust, strong answers that follow from using logic in a way that should be incontrovertible. At least we should be able to write proofs that everyone who agrees with our logical formulation and agrees with our axioms will, will agree to. But there's a lot of limits. Everything that we're doing with these mathematical models is not reality. Our models are not the same as real computers. Our models can be infinite. Having infinite models is really useful. It allows us to say robust things. If we didn't have infinite models, every problem that we define would be, say, an input up to this size. Or this limited set of inputs, it would be a finite problem, much less interesting to talk about. But of course, real machines have limits. Any real machine is going to be finite, which is really different. And part of what we did in the first part of the class where you talked about Boolean circuits was, well, those were finite. So at least there was a stronger connection between real machines. But also, those are very simple model that couldn't capture the things that we think of real computers being able to do. Our mathematical models are never going to capture the properties of the physical world that impact what happens when real machines run real programs. But they are going to give us useful insight, give us ways to understand what makes problems hard and what we can do when we encounter hard problems. And at least we hope if you, you've developed some sense that these are actually fun, interesting puzzles that have their own intellectual value. A lot of the reason we want to do theory on mathematical models, it's really for its intrinsic value, which sometimes you can relate to, yeah, this is a practical problem that is going to help, help you build your computing system that will take over the world. But often, there's a pretty big gap there. And it's actually really important to make sure that all the theoretical results, you realize you're getting them with a model, and you're getting them based on assumptions that are not ever true about real systems. The model that we've seen the most in at least the, the last half of the class is the Turing machine model. Our mathematical models take all the complexity of a real computer or of what we're trying to model and can turn it into something that fits pretty well on one slide. There's no way you could describe what's going on on your actual processor on your laptop on one slide. Intel's instruction manuals are thousands and thousands of pages and they don't describe everything that's going on there. OK, so with that set up, what does it actually mean in practice? What can we say about a problem once we've done this theoretical proof that it's NP-complete? As the size of the input that we want to evaluate Q on increases, what can we say? Well, we should be careful not to say non-polynomial. We can say like at least the best known solution Given what we know, there isn't a solution that is going to cost polynomial of time. Good, yes. Yeah, our definition of class NP and being NP complete means it is in class NP. So there exists some witness that we could use to verify. How does that help us practically? It takes a long time to compute it, but you can prove that it's correct. 
quickly. And there, there are lots of cases where that's actually very useful. So that does say solutions can be verified efficiently. Here. Yeah. So it sounds like, at least based on what we know today, we probably don't have a solution. So do we know it's always going to be expensive? Remember, what we've proven is there's some inputs. By proving that it's MP complete, we can use it to solve other hard problems. It doesn't mean that it's hard for every input. All it means is that for some inputs, but it might not be hard for all inputs. And this is actually a really important distinction. It's really useful to have problems that you know are hard if you want to do cryptography, because your goal is to have a problem that is hard for an adversary to break, but you have some backdoor that allows you to, if you have the key or you have some extra information, to solve it quickly. And people have tried to build crypto systems based on NP-complete problems, thinking this means it's hard. In order for it to be useful for cryptography, you have to know that the instance of the problem is actually a hard one. Right? And if you pick a random instance of most NP-complete problems, at least depending on the problem and how you pick it, there's no guarantee that a random instance is hard. There have to be infinitely many instances that are hard. The number of hard instances was finite. Well, then it wouldn't actually be a hard problem. You could have a lookup table for those ones, and all the other ones are easy. So there have to be infinitely many ones that are hard, but that doesn't mean that a randomly sampled one or a not carefully generated one will actually be hard. And what we've seen with satisfiability, for many of the problems that occur in practice, they're actually not hard. Even if the problem is NP hard, often particular inputs are easy. And of course, there may be good ways to approximate. Right? There may be good ways to approximate it that are perfectly useful for the problem we actually have to solve in practice. Being NP hard just means we can't get the optimal answer all the time without having work that's more than polynomial, assuming P is not equal to NP, or at least based on what we know about algorithms today. You have to be careful what it means in practice is not necessarily that every instance or even the instance you have to solve of this problem is actually hard. Mm -hmm.